hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. Amen. How many have your Bibles tonight? We're going to continue tonight in our study on church discipline. Let's say church discipline. I hope that these series of lessons are benefiting each of you. Some of you have made remarks about there being an encouragement to you. I don't suppose this is the type of series of studies that you would get excited about. I don't uh, particularly get excited about having to teach these kind of things. I'll be honest with you. It's not one of my favorite things to have to teach on. But it is certainly one of the necessary things that has to be taught. In fact, if you don't teach on these things once in a while, it's amazing how many little things can crop up that seem to need a lot of attention. And as the old saying goes, you know, a stitch in time saves nine. I'll be honest with you, most of the time when you have to teach subjects like this, maybe the one who needs it the most is the one who's least willing to accept it. So the Lord keeps using the word in sample or example in the Scripture. There's a lot of examples in the Scripture that I certainly wouldn't want to be the one that the Lord was using as example. Many Old Testament Scriptures mention people who, who have been mentioned in the New Testament, for example, that were not a positive example but a, a negative example. So in church discipline, it's so very vital that we understand why there even has to be such a thing. And of course, I've tried to enlarge upon the concept of discipline to show you that discipline in its truest form is basically just a style of life that we live, the order in which we conduct our lives, the pattern in which we live. And I tried to show you in previous Bible studies that primarily as Christians, we have to realize that we develop righteous habit. And uh, as Christians, we abhor evil and we cease to do the things that are unrighteous in our habits. Habits don't go easily. Sometimes it's a real struggle. But as Christians, we want to develop the kind of habits that are pleasing to God. Now, habit sounds like a, a, a meaningless or a, a rather bland word, but, but I want you to know tonight, those that have developed righteous habits are a blessing. People that come to church, they come out of a righteous habit. I, I'm sure tonight that everyone here doesn't feel too excited about being here, uh, but you know this is the place that you should be. You don't have to get up on the back of the benches and cheer every time you come to the house of God to prove that you're happy to be here, but when we're endeavoring to please the Lord, then we do things just because it's the thing to do. And when there's proper discipline, it's amazing how smooth some things can go. And the least little bit of, uh, you know... You know, straying from what we would consider good discipline, good order or rapport or manners or whatever adjective I could use tonight to just talk about things going smoothly, one little thing out of kilter can just throw the rest of it into also being affected as it were disarray. How many have ever been in a restaurant and the waitress forgot to bring you a fork and you sat there for for Ten minutes and, you know, waving and uh, you, you thought, well, I don't want to attempt to eat this lettuce with a spoon, but, and, uh, and finally, uh, after, after you've almost lost your patience and also your appetite for salad, uh, oh, did you need me? And so, but then when you go to those restaurants to where they kind of get you started and put something before you and say, we'll be right back, and you're sitting there just happy and eating away and drinking your ice water and not having to wave somebody down to get a drink and all that. And then before long, now we'd like to take your order. And it's cheerful. And then when they bring your order, is there anything else I can help you with? And you don't hardly get a chance to get three sips of coffee until they come around and say, uh, would you like some more coffee? Would you need that warmed up? Could I get you a fresh cup? You go away from there thinking that they really have thought their business through. While on the other hand, you go to some places where you... You go away wondering why they're even in that business because it seems like that everybody that comes in is a hindrance. We were traveling not too long ago and we went to a restaurant that had, had real good food, but the floor looked like it hadn't been swept in weeks. 
ever been to a restaurant like that? And one of the grandkids was running all over the restaurant and climbing in and out underneath the chairs of the customers and uh, got his head pinned up against the wall behind one of the customer's chair and screaming bloody murder and somebody had to come and get him out of there. Well, naturally, all the gravy and the biscuits and everything was greatly affected at that particular point by the disarray and the, you know, the impractical atmosphere that surrounded the good gravy and the biscuits and all. So what I'm trying to say is that basically discipline is what sets the pattern for the way we live or the way we conduct our business or the way we have church and particularly the way we might have our homes ordered and all these different things. Now, when it comes to the point that something's not exactly right, and then the word discipline means something a little bit different. It means that someone has to be instructed as to how to do things properly. And so discipline, more often than not, seems to hurt the one that's being disciplined. Have you ever noticed that? Most people that are being disciplined, they don't, they just no, ordinarily don't do don't just get too excited about the fact they're having to be disciplined. How many of your children, when they have to be disciplined, just beg you for it and say, Oh, I'm so happy you're going to, going to deal with me now. I, I know I've, uh, I, I'm, I'm worthy of it and I'm deserving and I want it soon because it's so good for me. And Scripture says the sooner you do it, the better it's going to be for me. And Oh, no, no. No, it doesn't work that way. But, you know, since we're members in particular in the body, it's amazing how that... Not one person that's truly in the body can be disciplined without it affecting the rest of us. In fact, when you see a brother needing discipline, it hurts you too. It hurts you because you know he's going to get it eventually. How many of you hurt for your brothers and sisters in the natural when you knew they were going to get a spanking? You might have wanted them to get it, but then when they got it, you cried too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've told you more than one time about Lorna when I'd spank her. My God in heaven, I'm telling you, you talk about it. She'd roll her eyes back in her head, and she'd follow her, and she said, My God, I'm dying, I'm dying. And I'd hold her in my arms, and her eyes, all I'd see is the white. And i tell you, I thought more than one time, that she's dying right in my arms. But uh, she didn't have to have many whippings, and when she got one, she didn't hardly know how to handle it. She thought she was going to die. It hurt me then. I felt like I was, a, a, you know, mean for having to, to correct her. But in spiritual matters, when you know that someone, and the Word of God just cutting them to the bone, and you know that as a pastor sometimes, I, you know exactly who I'm, who I'm uh, pointing the gun on. I hope you do. I hope that, I, that uh, you're not so blind you can't tell the ones that need some correction. But even though you know that the person or persons need that discipline, still we hurt for the fact that they, they have to be disciplined because we don't want to see anyone hurt. But yet it's much better to discipline the one and uh, see them hurt a little bit than it is to see the entire body of Christ suffer for the reason of someone going their, their way and rejecting the counsel of the Most High God. So the Scripture is very, very uh, replete with instances and illustrations that talk about persons hardening their heart. Let's say hardening the heart. What does that mean to you when someone hardens their heart? Someone give me a definition uh, when a person hardens their heart. Sister Brenda. There's a resistance there. In other words, you're not going to be able to do anything with them with that condition of their heart. All right, someone else, hardened heart. Sister Ray. Stubbornness. Okay. Stubbornness. Hardened heart. All right, someone else here quickly. Hardened heart. Sister Rosie. They back away sometimes from the ones that love them the most and resist them. Okay? One more illustration here. or Yes, Brother Steve. It's always uh, noted by a bad attitude. All right. Then the Scripture talks about hardening your neck and uh, resisting. And the Bible says a person that hardens their neck or is often reproved is seemingly suddenly cut off. And that, the Bible says, without remedy. I think the Lord showed me a little bit more about the real meaning of that a couple of years ago when I was teaching a Bible study that basically what takes place is the fact that the person loses their ability to be remedied. You see, the Lord is long-suffering, and He's gentle, He's kind, He's merciful, but the person who hardens their neck against God, then all of God's goodness can't seemingly reach them whatsoever. They just seemingly are cut away from the ability to be corrected by the Lord. And then the Bible uh, makes reference to the fact that the Bible 
itself is for reproof also. And so our attitude toward God's Word, and more particularly the church of the living God, which in the Scripture today the Lord wants us to see that the body of Christ is the church that's in the earth today. And we must recognize that how we treat the church for the Lord's body, then we're treating the Lord the same way. We're treating Him that same way, so we've got to be very careful. And the Bible makes a, a clear declaration that we need to really beware lest a root of bitterness would crop up in us. In other words, just a little root of bitterness is all it takes for us to uh, mess up the plan of God in our particular life. Now, last, last Wednesday night, as we begin to deal with the sins that require church discipline, in other words, the sins that obviously require some correction on the part of the church. In other words, there has to be a declaration of where the church stands on some things. Last week, I gave the list of all the scriptures that we would use in the seven different kinds of sins. We only were able to cover three of those categories. We covered backbiting. Let's say backbiting. And I pointed out to you that backbiting was causing dissension and factions that were brought about by word or by actions. Secondly, I talked to you last week about unruliness. Let's say unruliness. And this is being unteachable and rebellious. Let's say unruliness. Let's say backbiting. Then the third category that we dealt with last week, where we left off, was scoffing and spreading deception. Scoffing. And, of course, scoffing, is this, uh, this would just simply include uh, just making light of, making fun of, uh, putting down or, you know, just just literally trying to, to prove that uh, the Word of God or the way that it's being ministered is not proper. And then also by deception, trying to make it look like it's not the way that it's being indicated. That's really a real trick of the, of the enemy. He's been playing that trick for a long time. In fact, uh, Satan, uh, through the serpent there, beguiled Eve and, and beguiled Adam, really. They tricked them both and made them to believe that what God said wasn't really what he meant, intended. You know, you surely wouldn't die for doing something like that. So deception has certainly been around a long period of time. And, of course, this would also include the critics of, who manifest a wrong spirit in the body of Christ. And we dealt with that quite extensively. Now, tonight, we're going to continue. Hopefully, we can finish these last four categories that I would like to point out to you in the Bible study tonight. The fourth category in the second part here, of course, in the lesson, Sin That Requires Church Discipline, would be, number four, not providing for your family. Let's look now to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 8 as we go there very quickly, and we won't spend much time on this particular aspect tonight, but I think it's very vital. Now, one of the things that God is so much... A, against is people who will not provide for their own family. 1 Timothy uh, 5 and 8. Let's turn there. How many are there? But if any, provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, I think primarily here this is addressing the category of a man that is over his household. And uh, a man that has been given responsibilities to provide for his own household and shirks that responsibility of providing for his own household and willingly expects someone else to provide for his household and claims then still to be a Christian, that man is worthy of some strong rebuke from the ministry and from the Word of God. I mentioned to you a while back, somebody telling me they were thinking of getting married, and uh, they're not here tonight, but they were telling me that they, I said, well, how do you intend to, to support a wife? Well, if I have any problems, there's always welfare. I said, well, that proves to me you're not ready to get married, if you're already thinking of welfare before you even get married. Everybody said amen. I know it's risky to even use that word right now, because we live in a society, and we live in a city that's almost dependent upon that. I believe that people that have the Holy Ghost and have hell ought to be ashamed of themselves if they aren't willing to work. Say praise the Lord. Now, I don't want to mess up your day and I don't want to mess up your night, so let's move on. Let's go to the next category. <laughs> How many know that I believe that, and I, I, I mention it often enough, but 
I hope to God that you get the message on that one because I really do think that laziness has no place in the house of God. People that are too lazy to provide for their own are not worthy to even be called a Christian because the Bible says that uh, they are really, if any provide not for his, his own, especially for those of his own house, he's denied the faith, the Bible says, and is worse than an infidel. Infidel's pretty bad, but the Bible says a man that won't provide for his household is even worse than an infidel. In other words, he's proving that he's worse than an unbeliever. A person that's an infidel is a, and a person that is, is unwilling to provide for his family and has the ability to do so is worse than an infidel. And God meant that just the way he said it or he would not have said it. Now let's go on to the deeds of the flesh. This is the fifth category of sin that is worthy of being corrected by church discipline. Deeds of the flesh. 1 Timothy 5, and let's look at verse number 20. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 20. Them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. How many like that scripture? How many think that's one of the best ones? How many knew that was in the Bible? How many have always hoped that you didn't have to be on the receiving end of some deal like that? Oh, boy. Man, I want you to know that's one scripture that every time I have ever seen it in the Bible, it uh, it would trouble me when I was a, a little bit wayward. I'd think, oh, my God, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, you know. Uh, many, many times little things maybe crop up in a person's life and and uh, they just uh, don't, don't seem to have the ability to humble themselves and yield to God, if that sin causes the church distress and discomfort and there's discord or scoffing, mocking, deception being sown because of that, then the Bible says, gives you some pattern to go by to lead up to this point. Go to them, you know, if they've done you wrong, you know, and if you think they're against you, you go to them and all that business, and then finally get to the point that you've taken witnesses with you, you've tried to help them, You've counseled, and everybody and their brother knows what's what's wrong. And then finally, the person just persists in doing wrong. And uh, finally, you just have to simply say, Brother so-and-so, you're wrong. Brother Kraft is one of the most, uh, he's quick as a rabbit at some things. I mean, his timing, when he decides to move on a situation, he pastors a huge church, around a thousand people. And uh, he, when my son Mark was assisting him, he called a men's meeting one time. He got the men all together and said, Now, I'm not going to shoot all the birds in the tree to get the two of you that I'm after. He said, I'm after you and you. But that would save the body a lot of trouble. Because if I were to just talk in generalities all the time, you would go home thinking I was talking about you. Because some of you have such a tender conscience that you'd think you sinned even when you didn't. Because the devil would like to condemn you anyhow. The Bible tells me that he's constantly accusing us. And if we've got a tender conscience, some people will repent almost of anything and everything as often as the convicting power comes. And yet the person that it's really for will harden their neck and stiffen their neck and, and backbite and cause difficulty and never will repent. And yet the tender ones will repent and repent and they don't even need to repent. I've had people come to me and and uh, and confess and different things, and, I, and they'd think that I was talking about them. I'd say, look, you're not the one I'm even talking about. And uh, But their conscience was so tender. Now, that's a great quality as well. But what God is saying, when there are deeds that are done in the flesh that affect the body, it has to be dealt with, because if it's not dealt with, it will finally destroy uh, some member of the body. How many have ever had a boil? It just don't stop with a little pimple. I remember Brother George Chapman had boils a few years ago. Brother Keith Lehman's had boils. I've had boils. I want you to know, friend, it affects a large area, and the area that's not even close to it is throbbing. You're throbbing from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And so oftentimes uh, those sins that are going to affect the health of the body, they have to be dealt with. Little rashes can finally, you know, turn into full-blown sores and infections in, in a physical body. And then finally, the only thing that can help you to live is uh, have the doctor lance that ugly thing and let the poison out. 
And I, I told you in the last Bible study, and I want to reiterate this again tonight, particularly young people, and even more than young people, older folks too, when you know that the pastor has taught something that you know is for you and for everybody, and you still keep company with those that you know is not good for you and are going to drag you down, you are a foolish person to do that because the body ought to care more about itself than to do that. One of the police officials of this precinct talked to me this past week. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see some, some things solved around here in the near future. And it would be a horrible thing if somebody got involved with something just by association. When they close in on deals, it don't matter whether you're guilty or not. If you can't tell where you are at every particular time and you've got a little jittery spirit, you are labeled and got a record whether you want one or not. Say amen. Best thing to do is stay away from people that are not doing right. Say hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. Say thank you, Jesus. Now that's true also in spiritual life. If a person is bad for you spiritually, be wise enough to get away from them. They'll poison you and infect you with their evil spirit and their rebellion, and you'll be a party to that rebellion, and you won't be able to cope with it. Let's look now at Galatians chapter 5. Let's look at verses 19 through 21, talking about deeds of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. These are some of the things that are the deeds of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. Let's say adultery. How many believe adultery is wrong? How many think that a person that commits adultery ought to still be extended an arm of fellowship and an approval from the church? No. Say praise the Lord. If a person persists in living an adulterous life, they're not worthy of being fellowship with the church. Fornication. Let's say fornication. I know some pastors that interview the, mar the ones to be married. And, of course, I do this as well. And when they are planning to be married, they are asked the question, Have you been intimate with one another? And if they before God cannot say that they have not been, and they say they have been, they're not given a church wedding. Because there's no need of them acting like they can walk in white and suggest that they are a pure person when they've been intimate with one another. So the church doesn't get up and plaster their name on the wall and put their name in the bulletin, but you know what the score is when they're married in a private ceremony. You young men need to know that when a pastor says, leave girls alone in this matter of being intimate, this loving and mugging and passionate to expression to one another, that is not right for Christian young people. Say praise the Lord. Amen. Let's say purity. Paul said, flee fornication. Flee fornication. That means you get as far from it as you can. And when a young person commits fornication, sometimes they have to be set on the shelf for a period of time. Literally, put on the shelf for a period of time. Nobody needs to know why they're put on the shelf. It may be other things. But when you know that God says, flee fornication, then that means that if a person commits fornication, they don't need to be entertaining the idea of singing in the choir being a part of the church spiritual ministry and continue to walk in, in spirits of fornication. Say hallelujah. How many believe this is all right now? It's the Bible. Let's clap our hands for the Lord tonight. Let's say uncleanness. Lasciviousness. There's a lot of things we could go into detail here on tonight, but we, but we won't. Idolatry. Let's say idolatry. This is why oftentimes before a person is allowed a place in the church of service in the way of choir or teaching, uh, we have to ask them, are they going to be faithful? Are they going to be loyal? Are they intending to be there? Or do they intend to only be there when they want to be there? And that's the only way you can have a good ministry in a church is to have some degree of a standard so that you know that people are committed to doing what they know to do is right. And so if they don't do that, and they continue to feel that they ought to be used and that yet they're not faithful, the Bible teaches us that this is a form of idolatry. Idolatry in the New Testament sense is just simply thing worship. Anything that comes between us and God can become an idol to us. All right, let's read on. 
Witchcraft. Let's say witchcraft. We ought to be able to move on. I think that basically anybody that's uh, going by the horoscope for your rummage sales and all, you missed the boat. If you wake up and you find you got a chill and you got to get your little book out to find out what day it is and what signs under, you are in danger of being ru ruled and moved by a spirit of witchcraft that's in this world. So this is a sin that is worthy of being rebuked. Say amen. amen. Take a little time here. Variance. Let's say variance. Let's say hatred. If a person hates a brother and refuses to forgive and make peace, then that's a sin that's worthy to be corrected by the church. We can't hate each other. When everything's been done to make things right between individuals, it's time to lay it aside. Forgive. Put it on the altar. Make some corrections. As I've said, oftentimes not everything can be resolved, but things can be reconciled. We can both get right with God. And if we both get right with God, it'll take care of most of the things that we can't resolve. You won't always win arguments and, and be able to come out the winner. And You'll lose an argument along the road somewhere. Okay, let's say idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath. Strife, seditions, heresies. Once in a while, somebody will come up with some little funny doctrine in a church. We don't have much of that around here because I think that when you have a church that has strong Bible teaching, you don't have much of that. I hope to God we don't ever have much of it. But if we do, we'll kill it quick with the Bible. Say hallelujah. These funny little squirrely ideas that people come up with and call them doctrines and then try to impose all their funny ideas on the church. Hey, the Bible will take care of that just in fine order if we'll just keep preaching the Word. Don't you love the Word of God tonight? That's why we're doing this right here. See, this takes care of a whole bunch of things down the road. Say amen. So if a person heard a Bible study like this and they get some funny little idea, this will pop back in their mind just that quick. Don't even be discussing things that, in, that gender strife and judgmental things. There's a lot of difference in the body of Christ. There's a lot of different ideas and convictions. There's a lot of different ideas and standards here and there. But I want you to know one thing. We better keep our head on straight and believe all we can believe and keep our mouth shut and live for God. Because if we're not very careful, we'll mess up more good work that God could accomplish through our, our foolishness. Okay, let's say seditions. Let's say heresies. Let's say envyings. I refuse to pastor a bunch of people that are in cliques. If I find there's a click in a church, I want to smash that thing as quick as I can. I don't like this idea that people don't want to include uh, the body in what they do. When people sneak around and say, don't let so-and-so know we're going to go out to eat tonight, but we're all going someplace, and don't let so-and-so know we're going. If I hear about that, friend, we'll invite them and we'll all go. Say, praise the Lord. That stinks. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a little get together with your own personal friends from time to time, but don't make it sound like that everybody else is not good enough to be in your little group. Say hallelujah. Come on now. Don't, 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 uh, don't get too quiet on me tonight. Envyings. Let's say envyings. This is worthy also of being corrected because it's a sin. Envy is a sin. Murders. Oh, I hope there's no murders here tonight. Anybody kill anybody this week? If you kill somebody's influence, you're murdered, according to the Bible. My goodness, let's go on. Now, I know he didn't categorize that in the same bracket as actual murder, but he's saying that when you kill someone's influence, you've, you've the same as uh, made them dead because they've lost their ability to be, you know, an influential person to someone else. Drunkenness, of course, we know that that's not right. People that uh, want to drink uh, and still think they're in the body of Christ, they, they need to be rebuked. Mm. Drunkenness, let's say drunkenness. Revelings and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, they that which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, these are deeds of the flesh. Let's say deeds of the flesh. All right, now let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Some more things along these same lines of deeds of the flesh that are worthy to be corrected in the area of church discipline. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 13. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 13. 
It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Now, boy, this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He said, I've been getting a few words here that there's some fornication going on down there in that church. <laughs> That's kind of personal, isn't it? I've been hearing that some of the young people's laying out late at night and uh, doing some things that they shouldn't be doing. And he says here, I, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you, and such fornication as is not much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Now he goes on and he names something. Okay, so there's a guy in the church that wasn't married, and he was keeping company with his father's wife. And he said, you, you Corinthians are so stinking puffed up, you haven't even been sad about this. He said, you haven't even mourned that he, uh, he hath, hath done this deed, and that it might be taken from you, from among you. He said, you don't even seem to be concerned about it. You see, sometimes people think that they can have uh, relationships with people and do what comes naturally, and that God doesn't care about those kind of things. Amen. Say amen. Well, we're talking plain right now. God hates that kind of behavior. Paul said, you're so puffed up, you haven't even mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. In other words, you haven't even made this guy that's in sin feel so uncomfortable that he, he's, he doesn't even want to leave the church. He said, if you were as holy as you should be and living like you should be, you'd made him want to get out of there a long time ago. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged you already. He said, you're the one that's really, in my mind, you're the one that needs some help, he said. I've judged you already as though I were present concerning him that have done so, so done this deed. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan, he said, you ought to take that person in a spiritual way and turn him right over to the devil where he belongs... Now, that's Paul. How many know I'm reading from the Bible? To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, turn loose of that person. Let them, let them see they're wrong so that they can have a chance to be saved before it's too late. You can baby people in their sins, and they won't ever seemingly see the time to get right. He said, your glorying is not in good is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He's saying if you don't correct this thing, it'll finally get around to where all the other people think that the church don't have any standard and you can do whatever you want to do. Go with married women. Go with married men. Commit fornication. Lay out. Do anything you want to do. And that the church has got so much love and the choir sings so good and the preacher's got so much love. You just go on and love and love and love and love and love and let sin just seethe until it rots the whole group. He says, purge yourself, verse 7, purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now I wrote unto you in this epistle not to company with fornicators. How many, how many get the message here now of what he's talking about? How many of you know what fornication is? I hope you do. If you don't come around, I'll explain it to you after church. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with the idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner with such an one no, not to eat. Don't go to Elias with them. Don't hang around with them. Don't go for a ride with them. Don't do anything with them. Say, praise the Lord. If you value your salvation, you better dump everything that's not of God so you can make it. Your boat's loaded with sin. You're not going to be able to make it yourself because the devil's going to trip you as well. Verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? 
but them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Say, praise God. Say, praise God. You might say, well, that don't sound like a soul-winning message. No, it's not. But I'm telling you what, what's the good to win souls if you're going to just simply water the church down to where it has no standard whatsoever that people can live like the devil and lay like a bunch of dogs and not think that it's wrong? Amen. Everybody say praise the Lord. Let's clap our hands for the Lord. Oh, I don't go around asking everybody, have you commit fornication? If a person not living right before God, I don't even have to ask that question. That answers itself. I know that's what the flesh does. When people don't live right and aren't spiritual minded and they're keeping company with those that are not right with God, I know that's going to be a part of the deal. That's just the way the flesh is. Okay, now let's say the deeds of the flesh. All right, let's move on to the sixth thing that is worthy of church discipline. And that is certain wrong doctrine. Let's say certain wrong doctrine. All right, let's look at Galatians chapter 1. Let's read verses 8 and verse 9. Verses 8 and 9. Are you there? But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have preached un we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Sometimes people will come to you and tell you, well, I'm going to go to church over here at this little church because it's, a, it's in our neighborhood. And uh, they don't preach exactly like we preach, but it's near enough. They're good people. But Paul said, anyone that doesn't preach exactly what we preach to you let him be accursed. What did Paul preach? He preached the message that would save you. Amen. Say hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'll never forget the family I've mentioned to you repeatedly that were in our church in North Dakota that were several miles away from the, our church where we preached the truth, and they were in a church that preached part of the truth but not all the truth. So I began to see that if they didn't get out of that area and get in a church that preached the truth, it wasn't so much that what they were hearing was so bad, it was the idea that they weren't hearing the part they needed to hear. And so uh, it wasn't a good trade-out. You've got to hear what you need to hear in order for it to have effect on your family. If you're not hearing it, then something is going to, to go awry, awry down the road of life somewhere. I love Jesus, don't you? I love His holiness. I love water baptism in Jesus' name. I love a tongue-talking church. Praise the Lord. I love a church that loves God and loves the Word, loves each other. Hallelujah. Anything less than that is not for me. Say praise God. Now let's look at 2 John. Let's read the 10th and the 11th verses of this epistle of 2 John. 2 John. Let's read the 10th and the 11th verses. We're talking about certain wrong doctrine now. Certain wrong doctrine. The Bible says that men would be preaching or teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. And he said it would be in vain. Jesus said, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. All right, verses 10 and 11, 2 John. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Amen. Now, I don't know what you're going to do with that, but I just basically feel that that means exactly what it says. Now, I've been very kind on occasion to uh, Jehovah's Witnesses people and uh, Mormon people, people that are obviously in erroneous doctrine, but as far as making them... Uh, Kind of like I a fellowship them, you know, and bringing them in and acting like you know, well, they're just a, they're just like we are, friend. That's dangerous because sometimes a, something can go wrong in a situation like that. 
Brother Starr told us the other day at Brother Nix's meeting that they showed the film The Godmakers uh, at their church. We, of course, you remember, showed that film here showing the, the terrible, erroneous doctrine of the Mormon church. And he said they had quite a few Mormons out to church the night recently when they showed the film and said two of them sat with tears in their eyes. It moved them. Error is a terrible thing because a person that's hooked on error many times don't even know it and many times are not aware of what it's doing to them. So here in this epistle, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctor, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So here we see once again the danger of not having the right doctrine. Paul said if anybody comes preaching any other doctrine, don't give him the time of day. All right, let's look now at Titus chapter 3. Let's read again verses 9 through 11 as we have read them in a previous point that we brought in this Bible study. Titus chapter 3. Let's read verses 9 through 11. Titus chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Let's say reject. Let's say it again. Reject. I tell you, that's one of the hardest things for me to do. I have spent time and energy and money and time and energy and money and energy and time and money and tears and energy and prayer and time and money and energy and prayer and time and money. And I know good and well most of the time that it's like pouring, uh, pouring water in the ocean. If a person will not take the counsel of God and will not listen to the voice of a minister, you are wasting your time. If a person won't take the counsel of God and his elders and the word and anything, you cannot persuade them with your with your sweet personality. They'll still be the same way. And so the Bible says after you have recognized their spirit and you have seen that they're out in left field and they're not wanting to change, after you've done this two times, just simply put them where they belong in the hands of God and move on to more fruitful territory because you're wasting your time. Say praise the Lord. All right. Let's say certain wrong doctrine. All right. Now let's go back in the last, last particular category we're going to deal with tonight before we conclude just a few minutes here is blasphemy and slander. Let's say blasphemy and slander. Well, let's look back again to the book of... 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to look particularly here at uh, verse number 20. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 20. Let's say blaspheming. Let's say slander. How many of you remember a couple of years ago when I taught a Bible study and I had to teach it and be so plain? How many remember that? And I told you that these little gatherings that people always invite you, but they wouldn't think of inviting the pastor to some little meeting, and they've got some little deal, and this is one of the things that, uh, that women can really get messed up on. If you go to somebody to get your hair fixed, more often than not, you're going to hear more gossip while you're getting your hair fixed than you will anywhere. I don't care where it is, beauty shop, somebody's home, or whatever. Lorna used to fix hair, and I finally had to tell her who could come to our home. Because everybody that came brought another little tale to tell. Gossip, 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 gossip. And she's just a young girl, and I didn't want her to have to hear all the gossip. And while the one she's winding her hair up, this one's sitting over here waiting, her turning and running off at the mouth. And the one having her hair fixed running off at the mouth. And whether you want to hear it or not, you hear it because it's there. And so, obviously, when people gather, they're going to talk. And if they're not gathered for a good purpose, the talk's not going to end up right for your, your benefit. So I had to tell you back then to be careful where you went and to be careful who you associated with because I knew what I was talking about and I knew what was going on. 
And so I said, don't go. And certain parties was called, certain places. That, and the party wasn't the party. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. We love those that help in our church. You know they don't have anything good for you in mind if they're trying to tear down your confidence in the ones that your pastor has placed trust in. And then if they cunningly get around and try to discredit the leaders of your church, including the pastor, you know that they can't possibly have any good thing in mind for you because they're trying to destroy what little faith you do have so that you can become a victim of their gossip. And people like that will be going from one church to the next church from now until the Lord comes. And God only knows where he'll have to find them. He'll better have a forwarding address for them or he won't know where to pick them up from, I suppose. Because they may be gone from there. And of course, you know I'm only illustrating the point here. He knows where they are all the time. But God wants people to have some roots somewhere. And he wants people to have some commitment to one another where they won't let people run down their leaders. Where they won't let people run down your, your song leader. Where they won't let people run down the assistant pastor. Where they won't let people run down the pastor. Amen. Hallelujah. How many want to thank God for a, a family that loves one another? We've got a family here that loves one another. But we've got to protect that because those that are without would like to fix it where that wasn't the way it was. It's a hard thing. To have to countenance with people like that that you know are working against you at all times. And then to see them put that big old pasted smile on their face and extend a hand like they really love you. And you know who they've been talking to because the ones sometimes they talk to come and tell you and yet they'd have you to believe that they're one of your better friends. Praise the Lord. How are you? And there's something in me, I just don't want to be a hypocrite. I just would rather turn and go the other way than to try to act like that I approve of that individual when I know they're trying their best to tear down the work of God. Let's say slander. Let's say blasphemy. Oh, they'll say, I don't believe it the way he teaches it over there. I don't believe it. What well, the fact is, they don't believe it the way anybody teaches it. They're going to fish around until they find something that suits them, then they'll, it won't suit them for very long. They'll find something wrong with that. So the best thing to do is get your roots down Get your head on straight. Reject gossip. Say, look, I don't take that kind of talk now. I just uh, want to be your friend, but we're not going to talk about that. And if you want to be my friend, you can't run down our church or our pastor or those that work there with us. Now, if we want to be friends, that's the stipulations. I promise you, if you'll have that kind of, a, of an attitude, people will respect you for it. Because, in fact, they don't respect you a bit if you'll take criticism. Because they know that you're no better than they are if you'll receive their criticism. Say amen. All right. Let's go back through these seven things again. We're going to conclude here in just a very few minutes. First of all, and these are the sins. I want to read them to you again that require church discipline. First of all, I said backbiting. Let's say backbiting. That is causing dissension and factions by word or by actions. Secondly, unruliness being unteachable and rebellious. Number three, scoffing and spreading deception. Let's say scoffing and spreading deception. All right? Four, not providing for the family. Now, I want you to notice, if you know anybody that's guilty of one of these things, they're usually guilty of several of them. When people don't have any time to get a job, they normally have all the time in the world to talk and gab and yak and sow discord. You work all day long on a job, friend. You got anything at all to do at home. You got a yard to keep. You got a car to keep up. You got a family to feed. You don't have just a very little time to do anything. But people who don't have anything to do but just spread dissension and gossip, they seem to have all the time in the world, and they just roam the range causing trouble. Okay, number four, not providing for the family. Number five, deeds of the flesh. And there's so many of those that we won't endeavor to read them from the Scripture again. Number six, certain wrong doctrine. And number seven, blaspheming and slander. Now, here in conclusion tonight, in about five minutes, I want to uh, capsulize these things by bringing this little study tonight to a conclu conclusion. We will continue on in the series next Wednesday night. There's some more to it we want to cover. But in church discipline... 
The heart attitudes that are involved are of utmost importance. Church discipline, in effect, is an act of love. It's an act of love. Why? The Bible says that he chastens those whom he loves. One person a few years ago, every time I saw them, they were interviewing me about something, wanting to know the latest gossip or if I'd heard the latest gossip. I said, I'm not interested in hearing anything, gossip or otherwise. I'm, I make an attempt to try to stay away from other people's business. I make a conscious effort to mind my own business. And I said, I'm not interested in gossip. And I said, every time I've talked to you, uh, it's always an interview. Wanting to know this and that and the other. I don't want it anymore. And then a person that's judging everybody else, always judging everybody else, and yet they don't do anything to supply the positive effect on their side. Maybe they don't pay tithes, and yet they're mad at somebody else that here don't pay tithes. They'll be on somebody else's case because they don't pay tithes, and in fact, they don't pay tithes. I knew one person did that. Rebuke somebody that used to be in this church because they didn't pay tithes, and that person didn't pay tithes. <laughs> That's how wacky you can get when you get deceived by your own ways. Say praise the Lord. So the hard attitude and discipline is so important. So therefore, uh, those who take the lead, pastors, and those who are leaders in the church, have to have compassion. That's why that you have to pray for your minister that I would have compassion. And in most of the cases, I would go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, year in and year out, as long as a person would exercise any degree of cooperativeness. I would never judge them harshly if there was a sixteenth of an inch of progress. If I could see they were even making an attempt. My, my, I know how far the Lord brought all of us. But when a person puts their heels in the mud and rejects counsel and then begins to sow discord, then it's time that action has to be thrown into gear to stop that person from destroying other members of the body. Amen. Say hallelujah. Because we recognize that other people can become vulnerable if we allow the person to go unchecked. In other words, if a person can sin and are not uh, rebuked for that sin, then others will feel that they too can sin and the church then is watered down and it's affected. They praise the Lord. Now, I've dealt more in the spirit here since I pastored this church for the spirit, spirits of homosexuality than I ever have in any, any, any pastoral experience in my life or ministerial experience in my life. To my knowledge, there's not one of those spirits in this church now. But there has been in years gone by and I want you to know I've preached it as hard, but yet I've tried to be kind. But when people don't want to get delivered of that spirit, they don't like for you to preach about it. But it's going to be over this pulpit. We're not going to uh, whitewash any of these things here. We're going to still preach it. Say hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. person called me late one night and said, uh, you have discernment of spirits? And I said, well, I believe I do. I said, why? I said, well, I'm, you know what? I want to know if you know who I am. I said, yeah, I know who you are. You visited the services the other night, right after I took this church. I said, I know who you are. He said, well, I just wondered if you did. I said, yes, I know who you are, and I know what you are. I said, are you interested in being any different? We're interested in helping you. No, I'm not interested in being any different. I like the way I am. Well, I don't want them hanging around here. Amen. Say praise the Lord. I don't want to have to worry about your little babies going back and forth to the bathroom, wondering if somebody's going to take advantage of them. We're going to preach against sin. Say praise the Lord. Amen. And we're going to lay a line down, and we're going to have holiness, and we're going to have a standard. And we're not going to whitewash this thing for anybody. Say praise the Lord. So Jesus gave us the power to overcome the tempter. And if we're not interested sufficiently to overcome that tempter, it's because we won't let the Lord help us to have the power over that tempter. So if we want to walk in victory, we have to name sin, hate sin, reject sin, love righteousness, love holiness, love truth, and be willing to, to label all those things that would bring the body down to the level of just a street gutter. Have to reject it. Say praise the Lord. 
Amen. But in all of this, one thing we have to still maintain is our ability to grieve and have compassion over the sinner. I think that we should pray that God would give us such a deep love for the sinner. We've got to hate the sin, but we've got to have a love for the sinner. I believe Jesus did. I think that he was kind and gentle. And I know that he was meek and long-suffering, but yet he rebuked sin and he hated sin. So, in conclusion tonight, I just want to tell you that church discipline might seem painful for the moment, but it has to be administered for your sake and for mine. Amen. Say praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Amen. Let's love the Lord tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Would the musicians come? We're going to sing a chorus here before we go. Before we, before we conclude tonight, anyone have any, any questions or any comments about this particular part of the lesson? Sister Hicks. Next week, we'll possibly conclude this series. We'll be talking about the steps to discipline. Now, when I was young and growing up, it might have seemed that the ministry was a bit harsh, but I can really see their wisdom in a lot of things. There was nothing unusual if a person did really wrong, terribly wrong, about something or caused the church a lot of distress, that uh, they were set down officially for a period of time. How many have ever known that to be the case in churches? I know it's been in this church on occasion, and I'm thankful for that. But some people will not take your advice or won't take your counsel, so, so you have to strip them of all of their influence. There was one person that chose not to remain in this church a couple of years ago or so, and I told him, I said, now, if you're still going to intend to come to this church, I'd prefer you went somewhere else. If you don't intend to do right, well, then you've never taken my advice on anything else. I really don't know that I can help you. But I said, if you, if you stay in this church, you're coming before that advisory board in that church with me and the other elders of this church, and you're going to admit your wrongs in, in their presence. And you're going to be officially set down for maybe a period of two years because I said, you have done your wrong over and over and over and over and have rejected every counsel that I've given you or previous pastors have given you. And I've talked to your pastors for the last 15 or 20 years, and every one of them have said the same thing. Now, you're not tearing up our church. I said, now, if that's too rough for you, then you might as well go somewhere else because that's the way it's going to be if you stay here. I said, I want you to pray about it. So they went their merry way. But you see, there has to be a finality to some things or it would destroy a church. That person told their little story around to so many of you here and some of you came to me and said, Oh, Pastor, this horrible thing that's happened to so-and-so and so-and-so. I said, Let me tell you, they haven't told you the right story. So then the person wanted to go and apologize to everybody for telling the wrong story. I said, No, that will be necessary. I said, because you just use that to get more sympathy. Because they knew it was wrong when they told the first time. So then I had to tell everybody the right story that had heard the wrong story so to protect the people that, that were not uh, 
being treated properly. Church discipline has to be. Now, I want you to be glad when this little series is over and we can move along to talking about the love of God and the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts and miracles and healing. Hey, you can't have those things to get these things in gear. Say hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. Apostolic doctrine also includes apostolic discipline. Discipline. Let's say discipline. Say praise God. Amen. Now, Jesus, we love you tonight. We thank you, Lord, and I know, God, that this is not one of those lessons that the devil likes. But I know, Lord, it must be something that you're most interested in because you told us to do it. You told us to teach, and you told us to set forth the right examples. I pray, God, that you'll strengthen this church. Strengthen each of us, Lord. Strengthen our hearts and our minds. Give us a deeper love for the Word of God. Make our young people able, Lord, to commit themselves to true holiness all the way. Help them to put aside companions, Lord, that are not good for them. Help our young men, Lord, to keep company with only those young men that have good report. Help these young ladies, Lord, to keep company only with those that are of good report and a good name, good reputation. Lord, this doesn't mean that we cannot witness to those that are without. But, God, those that have shown by their deeds and actions that they're not willing to take teaching and instruction, Lord, we can't company with them. We can't eat with them. We can't spend time with them because, Lord, to do so is to become partaker in their evil deeds. Keep us, Lord. Help us, O oh God. And help, help every adult member of this church, Lord, to be a good example in word or in deed so that we can have a strong church always, a church with power and with anointing. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand? Hallelujah. Jesus getting us ready for that great day. Jesus getting us ready for that great day. Oh, Jesus getting us ready for that great day. Oh, who shall be able to stand? Oh, yes, my Jesus getting us ready for that great day. Jesus getting us ready for that great day. Oh, Jesus getting us ready for that great day. Who shall be able to stand? Praise the Lord. Let's clap our hands for the Lord tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Amen. I was noticing back in the tape room the other night, even in lessons like this where you have to just nail it down, people were back there lined up wanting to copy the tape. And so people that want to do right, they appreciate being told how to do right. None of this should hurt you. The Bible says, Great peace have they who love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. In fact, this ought to be so good to you, just almost shout, thinking, man, I'm so happy we're getting all this wonderful, sweet, sweet teaching here. Man, it just makes me love God. Something in your spirit doesn't like it. You need to go somewhere and put your nose down on the carpet and pray for a while so you can really, really enjoy it. I love every one of you, and that's why I feel responsible to instruct you in this manner. Because I want to protect you. I want to keep you. I wouldn't be a very good pastor if I didn't care. And I do care. You young people, I want you to really take uh, close consideration of who you keep company with. Amen. I don't need to be too personal on those lines, but uh, I do think that you know what I'm talking about. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go home. Amen. God bless you. Everybody shake hands. Be sure and greet Sister Lorna. She'll be leaving this Saturday. Won't see you anymore, so be sure and greet her before she has to go. You're dismissed.